Hi, um, my name is Orion Henry. Uh, this is my first Technori. I moved here to Chicago this summer with my family, and so I'm pretty new to this, so it's nice to meet you. Um, I, I hope you enjoy my talk. It's, it's a little technical, a little philosophical, but it, it's not too long, don't worry. So uh, I, I, I helped build Heroku. I don't work there anymore. I sold it in 2011. I left two years ago. Um, but we got to be one of the foundational companies that helped establish the cloud and make sort of what we all take for granted now is this fantastic integrated automated infrastructure that runs most of our online businesses these days. So um, it's been this powerful enabling paradigm uh, that's really, really changed things. I don't know if you, any of you ran startups back in 2005, but you needed a rack and a cage and a colo and you needed two or three system and guys who could wake up at two in the morning to go change out your motherboard when it blew. And most of us don't do that anymore. Most of us have access to fantastic virtualized uh, or and, and, and automated uh, infrastructure that, that, makes, that makes this uh, really, really easy these days. It becomes automated, it becomes simple. So to kind of, I wanna talk about uh, what's, what I think the, the paradigms that are gonna be coming after cloud are and, um, and, and what the enabling technologies may be as a part of that. And in order to sort of tell you why I care and, and um, I'm gonna tell you the story of Heroku really, really fast. It's a fun story, it deserves its own talk, um, but since we don't have much time, I'm going to give you the 60 second version. But uh, some other time over beers you should ask me because it's, it's a hilarious two hour story. <laughs> but um, anyways, um, 2006 Amazon Web Services uh, was launched and I consider this to kind of be the real kickoff for cloud computing where suddenly it really was very easy to uh, get as many virtualized servers as you wanted, as quick as you wanted, and it was nicer and better in almost every way. Well, maybe not in 2006, but it would eventually become nicer and better in almost every way than having your own hardware. And uh, things really got going. At that time, me and my co-founders were reading a book that we found very inspiring, some several books we found really inspiring that talked about end user computing and getting programming and getting computing to be more accessible to people to try to teach uh, computer literacy to a much wider audience than the very tiny niche of engineers who were, who were doing work at that time. And so in 2007, we founded Heroku. Um, it was, uh, we, we had this um, idea of trying to make it more, make coding more accessible. So a few months later, we joined Y Combinator, and this is a screenshot of our first product. This is a in the browser code editor, and this is, we had to write this from scratch on our own because there weren't cool code editors and browsers back then. But it was, you, you would go to the website, you'd make an account, you'd hit a button and you'd have a Ruby on Rails application. And you could edit the code in the browser, you didn't have to install the database, you didn't have to install a, a development environment locally. And, and you could you know, set things up and hit a button and wow, there's your application running and you didn't have to do anything other than edit a few lines of code. And this was really an educational tool to, uh, to help people learn. And the interesting business thing happened when a few months in, we noticed that lots of people were coming to our educational tool. They were taking pre-built Rails apps and uploading them into our tool and then running their business off of it. And to, to a not very opportunistic thinker, you'd be like, what are these people doing? They're trying to take advantage of our hard work and, and abuse the system. But instead we're like, ah, people really want this. So we decided to retool our system and to gear up and to turn this into a great place to man run a managed Ruby on Rails application. So early on, people are like, wait, this is going to be crazy. You're talking about potentially hundreds, maybe even thousands of applications all running. I mean, this is going to be nuts. And I was like, no, it's going to be easy. It's just the, it's the old client server model. Been, people have done it a million times. You've got all the clients on the outside. They're all going to connect to the servers. We'll have a bunch of servers and maybe some routers. And they'll, we'll spin up new EC2 instances when we need them. And, and they'll connect to things. And there'll be a couple of databases, maybe five. And it'll be easy. <laughs> Piece of cake. And Boy, we had no idea what we were getting ourselves into. Six months later, Google App Engine uh, launched, which is a very, very similar product to what we, we ended up building. And three years later, two years later, Microsoft Azure. And now suddenly, our crazy little idea, we're going up against the two biggest titans in the industry, uh, trying to develop the cloud computing platform. And again, fun stories here, skipping over all of that. 2011, 
we got acquired by Salesforce. And uh, they, they had uh, a lot of different cloud type products, but nothing they had was appealing to developers uh, uh, who were outside of their platform already and could run arbitrary applications in the cloud. And yay, we did the whole startup thing. We got funded, we got sold. We got to go to Dreamforce and get up on stage and, and yay, and a big announcement. We were in Y Combinator, so we got the coveted black t-shirt that says I made something people want. I love that shirt. That was awesome. And um, a lot of people would come to me with concerns about the cloud and about sort of this new world that we were building. Like, you know, is it a really good idea to centralize the, everything into a small number of companies, a small number of data centers? What about privacy? You know, if you do this, Google or Amazon or Heroku or, or whoever is going to potentially have access to some of your data. And, and I was always very much like, no, this is absolutely the way to go. The economies of scale in cloud are incredible. The fact that, that you can leverage the most brilliant minds in the industry to do your security, to do your infrastructure, to do your routing, you don't have to worry about that. You can focus on your core competencies. It's incredible. And besides, if you don't trust Google to, to play with your data, just move to Microsoft. If you don't trust Microsoft, move to EC2. If you don't trust, you know, there's, there's, no one's forcing you to interact with any individual party that you don't want to interact with. And, and this was a this was an argument I had a lot of times, and, and nowadays we everybody's using cloud, so it's not even much of a conversation anymore. The the world has come to trust this this type of interaction with a with a with a technical business. Now, this thing that we built that started off as is thousands of users connecting to dozens of apps. Just it, the basic model stayed the same, but it went crazy. Now we're dealing with hundreds of billions of requests coming through a massive routing mesh, going to millions of applications that are boiling like a cauldron inside of this thing that they're starting up and going down and rebooting and upgrading. And all of those requests and routes have to make it to the right place and petabytes of data are getting back up and restored. And, and it was awesome that it worked and oh my God, it was, crazy building that lie. I always would make it an analogy to like trying to, to rebuild the engine of an airplane while you're in flight, you know, because we could be, it was pretty wild. But then 2013 came and something happened that, that adjusted my feelings about this highly centralized architecture that the whole internet's moving towards. We, we, we were centralizing everything, a smaller number of companies with more and more apps, economies of scale, and then this guy showed up. I don't know if you know who he is, but it was a little shocking. And so I started to think about what alternatives do we have to this highly centralized new internet that we were building. It's, it, it's maybe some of the objections people had with privacy and things like that, maybe there's some grounding on that. We should at least devote some thought into alternatives to taking what the internet, which is this highly decentralized thing that we created that's extremely robust and is extremely resistant to, to, to censorship and to regulation and all kinds of things that sort of allowed this wild west world that we're all taking part on to start our businesses has allowed this to happen. Maybe we should pay more attention to that. And you can't really avoid the cloud because the, the, the benefits are so great. You're not going to take a, some kind of like, I don't know, moralistic stand when it's going to hurt your bottom line and make it harder to launch your business and harder to run your business. And it's just, it's not an option. And there's a lot of cool technologies like OpenStack and Docker that are sort of making it easier to sort of build your own cloud infrastructure. But that's, you're usually using those types of things on a service like EC2 anyway. And, and the, the cloud companies and platform companies are using these technologies also. And there's still tons of technological headroom for these guys to build out. So what about decentralized applications? Is this, is this a pipe dream? Is this something we can look into? So I started researching it. Like, what does a decentralized cloud look like? Is something like this even possible? And, and should we care? So here's my thesis that I've come up with. It, for many classes of applications, a decentralized model could, in theory, work as well or better than a centralized model, but we don't do it. Whenever we go to build an application, our first instinct is to follow the old model and to build that centralized one. Um, the reason we don't do it is because it's harder. It's a lot harder to build centralized applications. So does that mean it's off the table? Does that mean we're not going to build decentralized applications in the future? And I don't think so because kernels are hard and compilers are hard and all of us use them and we don't care because 
smart people solved these problems a while ago, and that's the beauty of software, is that we all get to benefit from that and, and sort of leverage solved hard problems without having to resolve them ourselves. So um, I started doing a survey of like what cool technologies exist today that allow for decentralized application development. And there's, there's BitTorrent, and there's blockchain, and there's Tor. Now imagine for a moment your product, whatever it is, you wanted to build it, instead of the traditional centralized method, you wanted to build it with BitTorrent and blockchain and Tor. Oh my God, you're gonna shoot yourself in the foot. This is, I mean, it sounds like a really interesting PhD thesis, but it does not sound like a way to build a business at all. So um, the verdict I came up with is, is we are super not there yet. There, the, 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 there's, this is undiscovered country, that there's, there's a huge amount of research and development that needs to happen here. And anyone who wants to go out and avoid the centralized application model at this point is probably making a big mistake. But there's, there's some good stuff here too. Um, there are places where decentralization, we don't think of it because it's not the tra traditional way of building applications. There are ways where places where decentralization can be really, really beneficial. Now let me show you IPython. Does anyone even know what this is? Is, is this the academic and science really like IPython? Okay, we got a couple. There's three people in the audience who know what this is. Um, super popular amongst academics. Um, basically, you have this code editor in a browser. Sound familiar? You get this code editor in a browser where you create this document with prose and images and Python code to create a usually like a scientific or research type document. And it comes with an with a application you install locally where you send the text of the Python to it. It executes, comes back with charts and graphs and displays in your browser. And then you can save the underlying file that's editing and send it to your peers over email. And then they can edit it locally. And, and people kind of use this like Microsoft Word for scientific computing documents. And um, it has a lot of problems. You got to install all this clunky software and Python and pip and, and maybe PyPy and all. Oh, it's, 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 it's a big it's a big pain in the butt. And then it relies on opening the CSV and C colon backslash something, something, something. And it's not on your computer, so it breaks. So, it, it's really popular, people really like it, but it's got huge levels of friction to deal with. So this enterprising startup named Jupiter comes along to try to solve all of these problems. And um, I read about these guys in the news when they got some funding, and they, I was curious to see what their plan was. I managed to get the founders on the phone and talk to them and said, so what, what's your plan? And they said, well, it's, it's, it's easy. We're going to spin up a whole bunch of Docker containers and manage them, and we're gonna put the Python instances inside of them. We'll get this routing mesh to put all the things in, and a database layer, and a persistence layer, and an orchestration layer. It's easy, we can totally do this. And I'm like, I'm having serious deja vu here, man. I feel like, let me just tell you, we've been there, and it is a huge pain in the ass. Is there any other way this can be done? And they didn't think so, but I've got a lot of free time these days. So I started doing some research, and I came across some technologies that are not traditionally thought of as being decentralized. They're not blockchain or anything sexy like that, but, but follow, me, follow along with me here. So WebAssembly, ASM.js, I don't know if anyone here is very familiar with this whole thing, but the browser, the JavaScript in the browser has over time been morphing into this really interesting low level, soon to be binary and compact compilation target for arbitrary code, instead of what it has been since a long time ago, which is kind of this scary JavaScript VM that's slowly gotten better over time. Anyways, you can now take a C application and compile it to WebAssembly and then run it on the browser. This is really interesting. And there's also WebRTC. I don't know if anyone here has played with that either, but this is a new extension. It's in all modern browsers, believe it or not, that was made by Google. And it's basically Google Hangouts in a box. It's, it's all of the weird networking tricks that allow you to circumvent firewalls to have your video feed and someone else's video feed so you can talk to each other. And it has a feature that nobody talks about, nobody knows about, isn't even really documented in the, in, in the documentation, which is data channels, the ability to do the same thing, but instead of with a video feed, with arbitrary channels of data. Okay, so how does this work? Here's a proof of concept that me and uh, my, uh, a friend of mine built over the last eight weeks. Um, you take an IPython notebook document, upload it into this app, it, parses, it takes the file format, parses it, puts it into a different, uh, a different format, and um, now we took PyPy, which is an implementation of Python, compiled it to WebAssembly, and it runs in the browser now. So instead of, having to, instead of having to have this big complicated Docker cloud thing going on where you're sending the code and getting it back, it's all, it all runs locally in the browser. It's instantaneous as you're typing, things can update. 
and other people who are writing the document. You see the two avatars there on the top right hand corner? Those two avatars are, are two different people who are writing the document. And they're not talking to each other through a server, a central server that does message interchange. They're using WebRTC to exchange edits to the document and to send messages to each other. So here if one person is editing the document, the other person is going in and live updating the Python which regenerates the table and they can update the Oklahoma there, can turn into Texas and the graph can update in real time. And none of this stuff is going to work very smoothly if it has to make a round trip to the server to this complicated expensive infrastructure that's on the back end. And right now, I can kill the server, I can shut down everything on the server side, the application continues to run, the two people can continue to edit it and collaborate it and chat with each other because it's completely decentralized after it's been bootstrapped by the traditional software. So not using any of the fancy crazy distributed stuff but just thinking about it slightly differently, we're able to make an implementation of the same thing that pushes all of the complex stuff out to the edges of the network and reduced the internal portions of the application to something very, very, very simple. So simpler infrastructure. Here's a situation where you're not going to, you're not going to be um, shooting yourself in the foot by trying to build something decentralized. You're actually going to make a significantly better product with significantly lower cost of running your centralized internal infrastructure because you've pushed all the logic out to the, ed the edge nodes. Now there are some downsides. There, there's uh, this project we put together. There's a lot of duct tape in there and to make it really work for real you'd have to port a couple li libraries over to PyPy. But the cost of doing that engineering versus building and running and maintaining this big complicated infrastructure is vastly smaller. I would argue is vastly, vastly smaller. So basically, in summary, what I want to say is I think distributed application development, I think it's coming. We're not here yet, but it, but it will be common eventually. And someone's going to come up with a cool name for it. Um, it's like cloud computing has a cool name. Decentralized computing is not a cool name. Someone needs to help with that. Um, and all of you are building applications mostly and, and you're making technical decisions about how to do things. So my, my ask to you is at least think about is there a way to do this in a more decentralized way. And, if, and it, sometimes you'll, you will miss opportunities that you don't think about because that, that, that client server model is so ground into our heads as the way that you build things. And if there is, add a little bit of it to it and open source something that you did and write a blog post about it and help the zeitgeist, the general understanding of how this stuff happened, develop and maybe in five or six years I can come back here and talk about this amazing, cool, snazzy way of building applications that's the sum total of the small discoveries and small uh, ideas and pieces of code that we've all put together. Um, when and how to use it will become obvious. Once we've done that, it is totally a pioneer area and the, mis the missing pieces will get filled in bit by bit. So. I think this is an exciting area. I think it's a, it's, we sort of have a bit of a responsibility to the internet to help it stay decentralized. Um, it'll keep our business opportunities stronger. It'll keep the internet stronger. And uh, so I open sourced all the code for the thing I just showed you and threw it up on GitHub a few days ago. Uh, it, it does that decentralized code sharing, document editing and whatnot and, and just try to kick the whole thing off. So that's, that's my feelings on it. I think the cloud's going to get more decentralized, maybe not completely ever, but uh, that's all.